saying yeah. and uh, the verse we've already read tonight this is just reminding how is all this possible for us to be blessed by God to have eternal life our sins forgiven us through Jesus coming and living in us.
Lord, we thank you. We have such hope because of everything you've done, Lord, because of Christ in us. We thank you, Lord. All these things can be true. And we just pray you'd speak to us this evening and help us, Lord. Amen. Okay, we're going to carry on singing and just lifting our eyes up to the throne where Jesus sits and where he rules everything. Father, we pray you would speak to us now from your word. Help us to see what you're like, who you are through Jesus this evening. And help us to adore you, Lord, to just absolutely love you, Lord, for everything you've done for us, for everything you are to us, Lord. For your glory's sake we ask. Amen. 
Okay, please be seated. Thanks, Carrie. The reading of God's word this evening is from John chapter 8, verses 2 to 11, and it's on page 757 of the Church Bible. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who had heard him began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Amen. Evening, how's everyone doing? Good. Good. Oh, sorry. Cool, let's just pray before we start. Father God, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that your heart is to save us. Lord, please share that heart with us this evening, Lord God. We need to hear it. Lord God, we need to hear it because the devil accuses Lord God, uh, the world can accuse, even our friends can accuse, Lord God, but you speak something different, Lord, and we need to hear that this evening, Lord God, help us to see your heart, Lord God, to save people, Lord, help us to know that's why you've come, Lord, you've come to save people, Lord God, you've not come to condemn them, Lord God, so please help me, Lord God, to preach your word this evening, help our, our hearts, Lord, to hear your word, Lord God, and help us, Lord God, is to have a heart to save, Father God. We thank you for that. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. We thank you for your kindness, Lord God, that we don't deserve, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're in John chapter 8, um, and we've been doing that through RBT, reading the Bible together. Um, in this, this situation here, basically you get people that are they're trying to catch God. So basically, they, they think they know what God is like, but really they're, they're self-righteous, they're religious, and they're trying to catch God, but God catches them. And many times that's what happens. If you, if you want to go down that road of trying to catch God, God's going to catch you. But there's, a, there's another side to this story. This, so imagine it in two different folds. You know, I, I, I do like the illustration. Sometimes the Word of God is like a... If you look at it through a diamond, you see one strand of light. You look through another part of the diamond, you see another strand of the light. And I think as you read the scriptures, you see strands of light uh, that, that show who God is. And, but the other side of that is sometimes the devil tries to catch you, and then God's going to release you. So there's sometimes where people are trying to catch God, and God's saying, actually, I've, I've caught you, I know what you're like. But there's other times, as a Christian, especially for us as Christians, for us as that the devil tries to catch you and then God comes along and he releases you. And if, you're, if you've been a Christian for any number of years, you know what that feels like. You know what it's like when the devil comes and accuses you, brings up your sin. It's interesting, he knows what your sin is, isn't it? And he just keeps repeating it. Um, and actually, the devil will actually use God's word to condemn you. And, but the good news is God has the last word. But there's another side of that in the world where people are religious 
and they try and catch God, and, but God catches them. But let me just read from verse 2. It says, At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, it commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? So you have this situation. Picture the scene. There's these Pharisees. There's these teachers of the law. And this is how they approach God. They catch a woman in adultery. <laughs> you think, well, how did they manage to catch her? Well, they must have been watching her. They must have known. But they use this woman as like a show trial before Jesus. It's like a show trial. And they're... Their heart is to catch Jesus. It says they want to trap Jesus. Why do they want to trap Jesus? They're jealous of him. They want to accuse him. They ultimately want to crucify him. They have that heart in them to crucify him. And so they use this woman as, the, as a show trial. She's the, the, the guinea pig, as it were. Poor woman, isn't it? Um, and they catch her in adultery, and they make her to stand before everybody. And also on the flip side, you know, like, that's how you feel as a Christian sometimes when you're accused. And it makes you stand in front of everybody and you're accused. And it says, the law of Moses says that this woman should be stoned. And are, are they lying? It's not, they're not lying. She should be stoned. You see in Leviticus 20:28, 20, it says, the law of Moses commands us to stone such women. It also commands you to stone the man, that he's not there, doesn't he? Because they're not interested. They're just interested to, to trap Jesus. So they, they come to Jesus, and basically what they're saying to Jesus is, we want judgment now. What is judgment? In other words, you want the final decision right now. I want the final decision over that person's life. When you, remember, when you've passed judgment, there's no going back. Once, there's, once judgment has been passed, that's the end of it. And what you're saying is, I want to make the, the final decision upon this life. And that's what they're wanting. They say, let's bring judgment now. I remember one guy saying to me about um, how to deal with all the addicts in Scotland. And he says, what we need to do is we get them in a boat, we put them on an island, and then we bomb it. And I remember thinking, you know, what sort of mind and heart is that that will say that to another person? But, and Jesus warns us, and be careful here, because we are to make decisions as a church. We are to make godly decisions, and we're not to um, just approve lifestyles and just say everything's okay. But at the same note, we do not become the judge, and we do not become the final decision in that person's life. And Jesus warns us, and he? he says, do not judge or you too will be judged. He says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you used, it will be measured back to you. I don't know if you've heard of that saying, isn't it? When you point a finger, three, three fingers are pointing back. Um, and that's, that's a true saying. God is saying, if, is, if you're going to think like that with this person, God's saying, this is, you're going to want that for yourself. So he, the Pharisees have come and they've dragged this woman in front of Jesus, that she's standing there, and she has committed adultery. But basically they're saying, right, Moses, uh, Jesus, your word says we've got to stone her right now, right at this moment. Um, I don't know whether they were saying, Jesus, you're going to stone her, or you've got to give us permission to stone her. But that's, that's what they're wanting to do. Um, and Jesus said, if, that measure, if, if you want to use that measure on somebody else, if you want to take all the addicts and put them on an island and bomb it, well, God said, well, is that what you want for yourself? You might look at their sin and say, that is awful and that is disgusting. But the Bible says you also, remember it says in Romans, when you pass judgment on somebody else, you, you're condemning yourself because you do the same things. You're in need of salvation um, and you're in need of being saved. And what happens is you, this measure, and I think this is why you get, people can get paranoid in church because you start using a measure on somebody else and you start feeling that measure upon yourself. You start using this critical mindset on somebody else and you look down at somebody else and then you start feeling, who's looking down at me? Who's judging me? Why is that? Because you're feeling the same measure. And Jesus is going to do that with these Pharisees. He's going to give them a taste of judgment. That's how he's going to deal with it. And he's basically going to say to him, can you handle that? Can you handle what you've just put on to this 
woman. And Jesus uses another thing in Matthew. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? And, and it's ridiculous, isn't it? He's saying, like, compared to you not... Because it's a heart that's saying, I don't need to deal with myself. I will, I'll project myself onto other people. I'll constantly look at other people and say, I'm better than such and such. Praise God, I, I've spoken to many of you in the church. You're not like that. We're not like that. Praise God. But let's keep not being like that. Because there is a mindset out there It's like that. There is a world out there that is like that. And as the hate grows, and it will grow, and as the judgmentalness grows, and the superior race grows, as it were, you'd be surprised how easy it is to be able to drag people and say, let's judge them now. They condemn them. You look at the Nazis, isn't it? They, how they were, were just filled with hate. They were filled with the superior race. And there was so much hate in their hearts that they were able to begin to drag people. And it wasn't a day, it wasn't a day of salvation, wasn't it? And we've got to be careful as we see things in the world that we don't adopt this, this mindset. Um, and it's that mindset of saying, I want to deal with, look what they've done, but not saying, look at me, what is in my life? What, what is it that needs to change in my life? What do I need to be rescued from? And Jesus says it's like a, like a s- s- sawdust and plank. He's saying, you're trying to see that sawdust in somebody's eye, a little speck of wood, but in, but in yours, you've got a big plank and you've got something that you need to be dealt with, that you need to be, because ultimately, you're not without sin, aren't you? All have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And Psalm 82 talks about Gods, the gods, little, and even Jesus calls us men in one point, little gods with a little g. But he says when they pass judgment, they know nothing. They know nothing and they understand nothing. And it says, God says in Psalm 75, I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. In other words, with fairness. God said, I'm going to choose the time. This is not the time for that woman. This was not the time for her. God was going to bring a time for judgment. There is a judgment. Don't get it wrong. It's not we just wink at sin, everything's fine. He's saying there is, a, there is a judgment. He says, but I'm going to choose the time for that moment. And he says, I will, and he says, I will do it with equity. I'll do it with, with fairness. But what these Pharisees and these teachers of the laws is saying, we're going to be the judge. And it, it's just like a boomerang. It just comes back at you. And I'm not, don't go down the road of, you know, we have police, we have courts, we have judges, etc. But this is a mindset that we adopt. And we've got to be so careful that when we look at people, we've just got a heart to condemn them. We've got a heart for judgment. And God said, my heart is not like that. My heart in this season of grace is to save them. He says, I look at them to save them. I look at them to rescue them. And so be careful, there will be a judgment, but if you start bringing judgment before mercy and switch it all around, well, how, you can't even have mercy after judgment, can you? You've got to have mercy, isn't it? Mercy triumphs over judgment and sin. I've got to want mercy for that person. And it can be hard. Don't don't get it wrong, we're not living in an easy environment where you, where you, you have to keep yourself in the love of God, the Bible says. In the book of Jude, it says, you know, especially in the last times, you have to keep yourself in the love of God. I said, I I still want to extend mercy to that person. I hate their clothing, as it were, the stain of their sin. I hate that. And don't get it wrong with God. He he does hate adultery. It is him that wrote the law with his finger and says they they should be stoned. Sin does bring, the wages of sin does bring death. But yet how can you have sin and how can you have judgment and yet this drive of mercy towards them? And we need to be a people like that, that we still have the mercy of God when we see people, it's people that are caught, people that did do that wrong, people that do have the word of the God written against them. But praise God, there's other parts of the word of God written, isn't there, that says mercy triumphs over judgment. And so we, we're, he, he's shown this grace and he's shown this mercy. And so Jesus, at this moment, it, she's brought in front of them, and let me read uh, verse five, well, verse four. And they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses commanded, the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. So they said, they'd done all this just to get him a trap, just to accuse him, just to, to be able to arrest him. And then Jesus does something amazing, which lots of people debate over what did he write 
what happened here, but basically Jesus bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote the ground with his finger. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until all Jesus was left. So he does something very amazing. So she's caught in adultery. They're saying stone her, bring judgment now. And he just, um, well actually this isn't the, when they first meet him, he's actually sitting down. So it's almost like he's sitting down and he bends over and he starts to write on the ground. And then he says, if anyone was without sin, you cast the first stone. So he writes, he speaks, and then he writes again. And it's interesting to know that it's after he writes and it's after he speaks and it's after he writes again, they start, they start going away. And you, ha- all of us have that in our, our life. It's, the, it's the, what you call the power of God's word. That he has a, a written word. Whatever you've said, he's already written his word. It already counterattacks everything you say. And you have that conviction. He writes, isn't he? He writes, in the, he writes and then he speaks to you and then he writes. And it, something in that writing and that speaking and then that writing again, then they go away. It's interesting because he, he writes and there's still, there's still not enough for them to go away. And sometimes like that with your life, is that there's right, God writes something in your life and it's still not enough for you to, to stop where you are. And then he speaks to you, doesn't he? He says, are you without sin? You, do you want to go down that path? If, you, if you're without sin, he says, let me read it there. If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. So he writes something and he says, if any one of you are without sin, then you throw a stone. Go on then. He basically gives you permission. He says, I'll let you throw the stone. I'll let you be as God if you don't have any sin in your life. He's not talking about the woman's life now. He's saying your life. Is, is there any sin in your life? And if there's not, then you can be as God. You can, you can pass this judgment. But it's interesting, he writes, he speaks, and it says, while he's speaking, they're still questioning him, and then he writes again, and then they start going away. Then they start going away. And like I said, many people say, well, what, do, what did he write? It doesn't actually record. It doesn't tell you what he written down. But I have a speculation of what, of what he wrote. This is what, and, this, and what I think he wrote is something that would make you go away, and I'll tell you what, what it will be if God was to, to, to write it. What I think God was writing, and it's interesting, the older ones go first. I think, what would make you stop in your tracks if God started to write your sin on the ground? And then he writes your name next to it. And he says, and I think what he's doing, I think he's saying, I'll give you a taste of judgment right now. Do you know what it's gonna be like at judgment? There's your name, and, and there's your sin. There's what you've done wrong. And, oh, let me give you a different visual. Imagine you right now, we're going to judge someone and condemn them. And I mean, you're going to, you know, we're not talking about just making decisions and, and being wise and making wise cho- choices. That word judgment has been miscued in this world. I'm talking about the judgment of God. You want to bring the final decision. Imagine you were like that right now and you're condemning somebody and on the screen flashed your sin and you're, it's you there. And I mean, it's, it's what you did. And, and God said, are you, go- are you going to do that while that's there? And I think that's, you know, we don't know what he wrote, but if he wrote that, it would stop, it would stop me. I know that. If I was to start speaking to you and condemning you and saying, because basically they're saying to this woman, there's no hope for you. There's no forgiveness for you. You can't get through. You can't, you can't go on. You're, you're going to be condemned now. You're going to be judged now. There's no hope. There's no life. There's no peace. There's no forgiveness. And that's what the devil does to you, isn't it? When he accuses you, he's saying, there's no hope for you. There's no forgiveness. You've sinned too much. This sin is unpardonable. God, God will never forgive you now. Your end has come. Because what they do is condemn her, which means punish, um, sentence punishment. That's what he's saying. Sentence punishment on that person. It's more than just accusation. It, accusation is what she's getting. But if, if it were to go through with the accusation, it's saying sentence them right now. And if you were to be like that to somebody else, and God said, well, what about you? and your sin was on that screen, I would be, I don't know about you, I'd, I'd be walking away. And it's interesting, the older ones walk away first, and I think the older ones walk away because they've got more to write. There's more sins, isn't there, and the flash. And you might have even forgotten them. God doesn't want to bring up sins just to, to, 
You know, God brings up sins because he, he wants to forgive them, but if they're not forgiven, he'll bring them up in judgment, won't he? And it's the only thing that will, will stop you. The Bible says when judgment comes, he silences every mouth. It doesn't matter what they said before. It doesn't matter what they boast. Once they see his hand of judgment upon them, it silences them. But the good news is God is not, Jesus has not come to do that, to condemn you. Jesus has come to save you. But you remember in, in um, Revelations, it says to the, one of the church, if you don't repent, he says, I'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He says, if you don't turn, he says, my mouth will be like a sword. And the Bible says, isn't it, the, the word of God is double-edged sword. It divides the soul and spirit. You know, these things that were connected, so connected, and it says, even the joints and the marrow, it says the word of God penetrates through those. The joints and the marrow, I don't know how well those things are connected, but I know if they weren't connected, I'd be feeling it. But God said, my word gets right in there. And this is the interesting thing, it says, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So God said, word comes in and it judges, why am I thinking like that? Why is my thoughts like that? And it's, the Bible says everything just gets laid bare. And I think that's what he's doing with those men. Remember, they are determined to trap Jesus. They're determined to get Jesus. And he just starts writing on the ground. I, I don't know about you. I've been like that in my life. Where I've been determined or I've been judging or I've been critical. And I've read the Bible and Jesus speaks to me. And then I've read it again and it stopped me in my tracks. I'm thinking, who am I? Who am I to pass judgment on somebody and say this is that and this is that? And, and, and you, you lose that heart of wanting to show mercy. You lose that heart of wanting to show grace. And you become like these Pharisees or the teachers of the law. You become like an animal, just instinct. And it's just like, I've caught somebody. Get them. I've caught somebody. I've get, get them. There's people in the world like that. You've, you've heard the conversation. I've caught somebody. Get them. I've caught somebody. Get them. I've caught somebody. And you think, what is that mindset? And they're perfect. They're nothing, they've done nothing wrong. You know, until Jesus starts writing, isn't it? And they see their sin. I don't know, but you, you, you had that experience when you turn to Jesus, he starts writing, you see your sin, and he speaks to you and he writes, and it, and it convicts you. Um, what's it say in Psalm 130, 30, verse 2? If the Lord kept the record of sins, who could stand? If he kept that, you know... We, we praise God, if you're a Christian, you live in grace, you live in forgiveness, he's forgotten your sins. But if he was to keep a record of them, you, you would not be able to stand. None of these men were able to stand. They all had to walk away. They know what he wrought. And you, that's the thing. I think you don't know what he wrought, but they know what he wrought. I don't know what he's wrought in your life, but you know what he's wrought. You know what he's wrought in your life. And, and everyone was, you've had... Something written in your vision that stops you. L the Lord has written something in your life. It, there'll be a verse. There's been a moment where God has spoken to you and it stopped you in your traps. He's wrote it in your vision and it's enough to, to, to stop you. So I'm, I'm not going to throw a stone. Um, and that's how powerful the word, word of God is. And I think, I think it was their sins he was writing. And I think he was putting their name next to it. And they were just like, I can't. I can't do this. I can't go forward in this. And, that, and that's, that's how the world approaches something. And that's how the, the world, that, that's they can have that Pharisee mindset, that religious mindset of just catching people to accuse them, to condemn them. And God said, that's not my heart. That's not my heart. There will be a judgment. He will deal with wicked. And I know that wickedness can be awful to you and you don't like it, but it, he's come into a wicked world to save it and to rescue it. And and it is a, is, a, is a weird combination, isn't it? Because you've got wicked people, sinful people, and yet he's going to say, I'm going to show mercy to them. I'm going to show grace to them. I'm going to show forgiveness to them. And if you want to be on the Pharisee side and just catch and condemn, God said, my, heart, my heart's not in that. And they were, because basically they're saying, Jesus, your heart isn't like this. This is what you're like. You throw the first stone. And he said, no, I'm not going to condemn this woman. Um, and that's the, the, the amazing good news is, if you see it there in verse. If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at the time, the older one first, until only Jesus was left. When the woman was still standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. 
Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So they all go away and on all you've got now is Jesus. And you, this, is, this is for you as a Christian as well. If you have the devil come and accusing you and he reminds you of a, of a sin and he, he's, he's repeating it to you, Jesus will clear the deck and he'll say, right, now it's just me and you. And now he, you're going to hear the words from him, neither do I condemn you. And that's all we need to hear. And it's from all you who need to hear it from. It doesn't matter if all these voices are against you. Jesus is clear that it doesn't even matter what the devil is accusing you of. You, you need to hear Jesus say, I, I don't condemn you. If you've turned to me, if you've come for forgiveness, if you've put your trust in me, I don't condemn you. It doesn't matter who else is trying to condemn you. It doesn't matter who else is trying to attack you. God is the one. He is the judge. He, remember, the finger that he wrote in the, the ground was the same finger that he wrote the, the law of Moses with. And so that's what you need to hear. And God will get you to that place. You might have to go through the accusations. You might have to go through that moment. But he'll get you to that place where he doesn't condemn you. Remember in the book of Zechariah, you've got Joshua the high priest. And Joshua the high priest, he's going to have to go into a role where he has to represent Jesus. He has to go into a role where he has to serve Jesus. And you might think, well, that's straightforward. I'll go and serve Jesus in my school. I'll go and serve Jesus um, in church, I'll go and serve Jesus in my workplace. But I guarantee you, the moment you start trying to serve Jesus, the accusations, like the volume of the accusations will get louder and louder and louder. They'll get louder. And that's what was going to happen with Joshua the high priest. And God, God says that he, he was standing there in filthy clothes, and the devil is standing next to him, accusing him. And that's what it feels like for you, isn't it? When you, when, you know, because we've all sinned, we've come out of sin and been saved and rescued. So in one way, we do have a track record. This woman did commit adultery. She does have a track record. She is a sinner. She does need to be rescued. And you do need to leave your life of sin. But there comes this moment where God is, is rescuing you and he, he's saving you. And he's got these filthy ra rags and the devil is accusing. And what does Jesus say? Does Jesus say, oh, you're sorry, devil. I didn't see that. You're right. Yeah, I, I didn't realize he was that much of a sinner, so yeah, let's banish him. Does Jesus do that? Does Jesus go, you know, thank you for pointing out his sin? You know, it's something that I didn't see. Maybe you knew more. Um, but he doesn't do that. Jesus is saying, he says this amazing words. Is this man a, not a burning stick snatched from the fire? In other words, Jesus says, I know this man. I know what he's been plucked from. It's like Jesus saying, I know who I'm saving. It's like the devil saying, don't you know you're saving sinners? And Jesus like, I do know I'm saving sinners. I do know who I'm coming to rescue. I do know the people that is in front of me. He does know this woman is in front of you. But he's, but he's basically saying, I've got a heart to save them. I've got come a heart to rescue him. And he says these amazing words while the devil is accusing. And he reminds the devil, isn't it? He's saying, I know where these come from. You're just there to accuse him. You're trying to there to drag him back. You're trying to there just to, to bring him into this place of, of condemnation. Remember, the devil has no power to condemn you. He's only got power to accuse. He's, ask, he's asking the Lord to condemn him. That's what the Pharisees did. They have no power really to condemn this woman. He's asking Jesus, you condemn them. You write them off. Um, and it says there, Jesus says, take off his filthy clothes and see, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. And that's what you get. God said, I'm going to take off these filthy clothes of accusation. I'm going to put rich garments on you. I'm going to put the forgiveness, the love. You're a child of God. You have been shown mercy. You've been shown. That was the way in. You got mercy. Yes, of course, if you tried to go and say, was this because of my good works? Was this because I said something? No, you, you were in filthy rags. But he said, I'm going to show mercy to you. I'm going to show forgiveness to you out of the, the love and kindness of his heart because Jesus has died on the cross and he's shown you that, that forgiveness. And he says, neither do I condemn you. It says in Psalm 109 verse 30, it says, for he stands at the right hand of the needy to save their lives from those who would condemn them. And God, God said, I stand at your right hand side. The good news is when the devil condemns, condemns you, it just gives you another reminder of the gospel again. It makes you think, well, I've got to go back to mercy because that's the only way I'm going to get this condemnation and this horrible accusation off me. And it's true, that's why you'll, go, you'll find it difficult if you try and go through other doors that are not of mercy and of grace. But actually, the, the accusation helps you hear the gospel again. 
And so it's by mercy, it's by grace, and it generates that, that thankfulness. And what God, it's amazing, isn't it? What God writes is more powerful than what the devil accuses you with. What God has written, what God says is more powerful than what he'll ever accuse you. And it's, I know it's horrible that the devil accuses you and the devil says there's no hope. The devil says that you've sinned too much. The devil says that sin you've committed disqualifies you, as you're gone. But yet God's saying what I've written, if I've said you're not condemned, then you're, 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 you're rescued. In Psalm, the second part of that verse, in, and this confirms it, the second part of that verse in Psalm 130 says, if you, Lord, kept the record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But then it says, but with you there is forgiveness so that with reverence we can serve you. It said, if you kept the record of sins, I couldn't serve you, Lord God. If, if the, what the devil says would stand, I couldn't serve you. But he says, but because there's forgiveness, now in the fear of God, I can serve the Lord. That the ending point is forgiveness. The ending point is being forgiven of your sin. And God, Jesus, and this is my heart, this is my heart to save. I've come to save people. There was a, a um, let me just use this guy's story because it helps illustrate the point. There's a guy called Desmond Dawes, okay? Desmond Dawes, quite a cool name, I think. But basically, he was awarded the highest honor in the American military, the, the, one of the highest honor. And the amazing thing is, he never had a gun. They were out to fight the Japanese and Desmond Dawes, he was a conscientious, conscientious objector. He didn't want to kill anybody. And he says, I'll go in as the medic. I'll go in just to save people. That way my whole purpose is to save him. The other guys didn't like him. They threw boots at him because he thought he's just going to be a, 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 he's just going to be a shirker. He's going to you know, waste time. He's just been lazy. And that's what they accused him of. That he's going to be like that. And when they get to, the, there's a, Part of the battle, there's this steep hill, and the American, the general, the commander, whatever says, on all costs, you must take this steep hill. And it was a steep hill where the Japanese are on top and they're heavily armed. You go up the top, you're just cannon fodder, you're just going to get shot at. But he says, there's no way around. Unless we take this hill, you're not going to be saved, you're not going to be rescued. And so they, they had the orders, the American soldiers had to go up and fight. And Desmond Dawes, was eventually awarded the, the highest honor because he, he saved many people over the time, but in one day he saved 75 men. And he would go up, it was like a, a steep hill like this, like an embankment like that, and he would go up the top while the Japanese are shooting and he would be rescuing the men and he would make this rope and he would lower them down. And 75 men were saved in that day. And it's amazing. You know, and they asked him, like, where did you get the courage? Where did you get the, the bravery to do that? And it says that he would read and pray and read the Bible. But I think what happened is he read and prayed the Bible. He, he had that need to save someone. He said, I've come to save. I've come to rescue. And it gave him, it gave him that courage. And it's amazing. And he would pray this. He'd say, Lord, please help me to get one more. Please help me to get one more person. And all these men who were throwing boots at him, were against him, actually turned around. And they were the ones that had to, when he got honored at the end by the American military, those guys had to say, they were the ones given the recommendations and the testimonies. And said, Desmond, it, all his heart was the same. Not once did he shoot a gun. Not once did he want to, to use, he didn't even have a weapon, so he didn't, he didn't even use it. And it says even that the, the Japanese soldiers and um, one of the Japanese soldiers gave a testimony later and says, I saw him and I was trying to shoot him. And every time I'm trying to shoot him, my gun was jamming. <laughs> you know, God's hand was in it. But you see, how much more, that's Jesus towards you. He's, he's got a heart to save you. He's not come just to condemn and just to catch. If he wanted to catch you, he'd catch you very quickly. And if he wanted to pass judgment, he would do it very quickly and very easily in that sense. Not it'd be easy on God, but in terms of, been able to do it and pass it, he'd be able to do that. He said, I've come to save you. I've come, I've come to, to rescue you and, 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 and save you from this life of sin. And that's what his heart is. And he's coming to this, just like that steep bank, isn't it? He's coming saying, you know, that's like that cross and he's come to lay down his life at all costs. He's going to lay down his life for you and say, that's my heart to, to rescue you and merciful. And yes, I know I'm rescue and sinners. 
And just the last point, just to, because he does say to this woman, go now and leave your life of sin. The thing about it, she, she gets, neither do I condemn you, and that's the good news, but you, you always, actually the last thing she has ringing in her ears is leave your life of sin. Remember what Jesus says, if your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. Jesus is saying to her, turn away from your sin. Turn away from what is destroying you. Turn away from this, what is going to bring judgment. He's saying there is judgment and that is going to come because of sin. But if you turn to me, he's saying, I will rescue you. And that's why it's important. You should get rid of sin. Cut it off, delete it, throw it out, whatever it is. Get rid of it because Jesus... Wants to, wants to save you. There was a preacher in America called David Wilkinson, and it says this man had an ability to see God's future in a person. In other words, he would see a person and he'd be able to say, you have got a future. You have got a hope. You have got a life. And I think that's what Jesus is doing with this woman. He said, I know you've been caught, but you've got a life now. Well, you've got a, a future. And he, he caught someone, he caught a young man and he came over to Britain and he caught a young man trying to get into McDonald's. And it says this young man was going crazy and he's screaming at the doors of McDonald's and he's trying to get in there. He's going mental. And David Wilkins is only like a skinny little preacher, but he grabbed the man and he looked at the man and he, well, the boy, it was like a man boy probably. And this teenager screaming and he looked at him and he said, this is not you. This is not you. And that's all he said, this is not you. And that's what God says to us, isn't it? This, when we sin, when we go into sin, they say, that's not you. Your life, you've got a future in God. You've got a hope. You've got a, a new life. Let's just end with this verse. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Let's just pray now. Let's pray that we have that heart to save. Let's, let's pray that in this environment, with people trying to smash into McDonald's, with people trying to smash into church this evening, We've still got the heart to save. We don't just condemn them and say, ah, oh, there's no hope for them. We say, we see God's future in their life. Let's pray. Father God, please help me. Lord God, I would maybe find it convenient to condemn, but if my sins were put on the screen, I would be the first one to run out of this church. Lord God. Lord, and I thank you that you've not kept the record of my sins. You've, you've deleted them. Lord God, you've... you've Wipe them away, Lord. Help us to want that for every person in this town, Lord God, that you would save, you would rescue. Lord God, that you want to show mercy. Lord God, please help us to have that heart, Lord God. Especially in these coming days, it's going to be so much easier to judge people. It's going to be so much easier to condemn them on social media and all the things that come down the road, Lord God. It's going to be, it could easily start getting to an environment like that. So please help us. Help us to have that mercy in our hearts. Help us to have that ready to to hear your words, neither do I condemn them, Lord God, that you've come to save them, you've come to rescue them. Help us to see the cross of Jesus, Lord, again, and remember our own mercy, Lord God, and to show that mercy to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to sing our last song, which just helps us to think about what we've heard Jesus speak to us about. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing, and then the prayer, let mercy fall on me. We all need Jesus' forgiveness. So if we're able, we'll stand to sing.
Okay, at the end of the service, we just like to raise our hands, uh, so please feel free to do that with us. Just to say, Jesus, we want to hear you send us out into this week, and I think these words go well with what we've heard this evening from the end of Jude, and it says this, to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen.